All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get going. We don't have too many people here yet. We'll see if some more people join. Um, I want to spend most of the time yeah, talking about the kind of showing, getting started on the first um, programming assignment. So, but, um, uh, but let me do just a quick five minutes or so. Uh, I did return back the first problem set. Um, and maybe I can see if there's any questions from the ones that I have here at the moment. Uh, but um, for these problem sets, I'll usually post a solution like this. I also give more individual feedback in the form of a markdown file. Um, so you can look at it's just a plain text file. But um, if you don't know, maybe I'll show it to you in Visual Studio Code. You can open up a markdown file and actually render it. So it's, it's, a, it's a markup language like HTML or something like that. So, so if you want to a more easier to read kind of version of it, uh, put it into Visual Studio Code and render the markdown. So, um, so I didn't have a whole lot to say. I mean, you know, most people got most of these uh, common mistakes. So the first one was a simple, um, so in the solution here, I actually um, decoded all the instructions in the representation here. Um, and we're using some color here to indicate modifications that are happening. So for the fetches, uh, the only thing that should happen is the instruction register gets updated. Um, and for the execute, usually it's the accumulator or, or maybe the program counter or maybe um, like on a store, um, a value gets written out to memory. So for this first one, we did a subtraction and then an add and then stored the result. Okay. So the only big problem on this one, you know, um, I did say that all the values should be represented as hexadecimal. Some people were still represent this 10. So for this add here, you get three plus seven, the result is 10 decimal or uh, a hexadecimal. Uh, and then the store ends up putting it out there. I think, I mean, like I was saying, most everybody that submitted um, this first problem set looked like they were doing fine, uh, kind of understood the fetch execute cycle. Um, and also we're kind of doing things correctly for the jump. So I didn't, I don't think I had anybody misinterpreting like doing these jumps that I kind of added into this hypothetical machine. So um, for the second problem, um, again, I think the, the, the most common one was, was people not representing uh, negative numbers correctly. You know, so I talked a little bit about this on the, the help session before we did the problem set. So in particular on this one, uh, we first do a subtract and that gets you a two minus two. So you get a zero. Um, and then, like I was saying, most people were getting the jump, absolute jump, or like the jump on zero. So since the re result of the last um, instruction execution was zero, the jump should happen. So, so a jump basically modifies the program counter instead of modifying the accumulator or memory. Right? So this is an example of a flow control uh, instruction for a computer architecture. Um, um, but yeah, go ahead. Quick. Quick question: uh, the, Did you have to label like what to subtract and jump or store? Uh, no, you didn't have to do that. So just as long as the values, the hex, hex values were correct on all these. So, yeah. Okay. Um. So so yeah, the result of this jump is to jump back to um, address three hundred. Well, we'll fetch the subtraction again. So yeah, I mean the first thing where people were weren't representing negative numbers correctly, it correctly was to, you know, just do negative two here or something, but using our side magnitude format, uh, this should have a one in the sign bit. And then we have all zeros except for a magnitude of one, one here. So that's going to end up being eight because it's the first four bits are one, then zero, zero, zero. So that's eight hexadecimal. And then you have two zeros and then a two at the end there. So, so you get your eight, zero, zero, two. Um, um, and then, then yeah, you don't end up performing the jump on the last here. So you should have had the program counter at 302. I, I don't, I might, I forgot. I, I don't know if I was checking that closely enough on a lot of people, but yeah, your program counter should have been incremented instead of going back to 300. That's the only way you can tell whether you did the jump or not, jump on zero or not here. So, um, and then for problem three, again, you know, uh, the most common thing is people, not realizing that that um, 8003 is actually negative three in our hypothetical machines. So the add is not 8003 plus two, it's negative three plus two gives you a negative one. Um, and then the negative one gets stored out in the memory. Um, and then we have an absolute jump. So we go back and subtract or, and, and add two again. So the negative one 
um, negative one plus two becomes positive one uh, when we perform the add the second time here. Another question I had is that uh, I accidentally didn't submit it when I put it in the E2L. I'm yeah. wondering how much how much do you take off for late? Uh, well, um, I mean, everybody try and get it submitted, you know, by the due date, certainly before I grade the stuff. But yeah, I saw you, you submitted it like a minute or two after. Um, I will grade that one. But there are about four or five people that didn't submit something that... You know, um, I normally am not going to be grading late submissions because we have too tight of a schedule and, and I can't really go back and grade stuff. So have an extra effort to get things in on time for the class here. So, but, but yeah, yeah good, that's a good warning for everybody. So. But definitely, I mean, uh, the, this, the, the particular student that's asking did submit something, uh, I mean, right when I had posted the solution. I mean, in general, if you haven't submitted things, you know, an hour after I post a solution or something, I also I may or may not look at it later on. Um, but but uh, if it's been a while since the solution was posted, definitely there would be some stuff taken off. So anyway, so let, let's wrap this up because, like I said, I didn't really. I, m most people I think were fine on this, had the concept. So um, um, uh, so so yeah, we end up loading a value here, and then when you subtract it from itself, most people were getting zero. Um, and then again, I mean, some people weren't quite representing the negative result here, but subtracting zero minus FC should get you a negative FC hexadecimal, uh, which should show up as eight zero FC on this uh, fourth one. So. All right. Um, yeah, let's let me go ahead and move on. Um, so kind of looking here, I see that uh, besides my GA, only five people so far have actually accepted the assignment. Um, somebody. Have met, oh, six people now have accepted the assignment, although only one's made a commit so far. So, uh, I mean, you know, you might want to start a little bit earlier than this. Uh, I mean, you know, especially the people that haven't even looked at the assignment by accepting it and things. So, um, I'm going to go so ahead. Where do you find this assignment? I, I didn't. Uh, so I'm going to go through all the steps, uh, remind you how to kind of get started here. So, basically, if you go to content, I usually just go, you know, click the content. Uh, we've got all the things broken down by units. Uh, the the program assignment is usually going to be showing up on the second task for each unit. Uh, so yeah, program assignment here is under two. Um, if you click on that, you'll get the link that you need. Um, so that's if you when you click on that link, that'll take you to where you can accept the assignment in GitHub. So I'm, I'm going to copy that and accept that. Uh, over here where I'm logged in to my TMUC student account. So by clicking on the link, you should get the, the same. Uh, this time it won't, if you've already associated uh, with uh, an ID for the classroom, it won't ask for that, but it will ask you to select the team again, I think, or maybe not, but but uh, you, should, you shouldn't get a re-accept because I've done this assignment before and I deleted it, but it should just ask, ask you to accept it again, I believe. So, uh, But what this is doing is kind of the first of four steps here. This is actually making, is creating your own version of the assignment one repository for you to use on GitHub here. So yeah, if you accept it, um, if you wait a bit, you should get your own assignment one dash team name repository in, in our CSCI 430 <coughs> OS Summer 22 um, organization here. Um, so that's always your first step. Uh, there should usually, usually be a checklist to remind you. So we, we just did step one, accepted the assignment, which um, um, created your version of the assignment repository in GitHub. Uh, now we want to clone this um, repository into VS Code and get it open in a dev container. Um, so, you know, you have to, I'm, I'm assuming you should have, already have your SSH key set up and stuff. And, and um, well, not everybody, but a lot of people did get assignment zero of the practice done or mostly done, which is good. Uh, but anyway, so I'll copy the, the SSH URL here. Um, and uh, what I want to do is I want to, uh, I want to clone that. Uh, right, so if you've got all your kind of kinks worked out, um, you should be able to clone here. Um, one thing, um, 
I'm going to go ahead and clone it. Uh, and, and I'm going to select um, a local directory. I, I always use my repos directory to clone things into. Uh, oh, again, though, um, um, I need to delete my old version of the local repository. Um, so let me do something real quick here to uh, delete that old repository. See, these, these are only copy. These repositories, when you clone them, are just copies. You know, so it doesn't, as long as you've pushed any stuff that you want to save, to GitHub, it doesn't really matter if, if I delete that because the stuff that I really want is in my GitHub repository. You know, assuming that you don't have unpushed, uncommitted stuff in the repository when you delete it. So, anyway, let, let me try that clone step again. So we'll, we'll paste in the URL. Uh, I'll select my repos directory to clone it into. Um, and did I, I, did, I deleted the wrong. I guess I deleted the wrong one there. Sorry about that. Uh, let's try it again. So I'll go to my repos. Um, yeah, so I don't have the assignment one TMUC team. I got an old version of that. So uh, anyway, so I'll do that. That should um correctly clone now if you have an error here either maybe your ssh key isn't correct what one of the the issues that i found is if you're seeing um um what was it i'm going to remind myself so so there, there were some announcements about uh issues and workarounds um that we found out with people working on assignment zero so uh, it's, it's, it's actually currently it's the announcement after the most recent one. So um, um, so if your side, if your source control sidebar is saying something about the, 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 the folder currently open doesn't have a Git repository, uh, you might have this first issue. Uh, and then on the second one, it, most people are able to actually use Git to like clone stuff and make commits. But when you go to do a push, if you get an error message about, uh, it looks kind of like your SSH key isn't correct. Uh, maybe I'll show kind of this work around here. So uh, yeah, we're going to go over task one here. So let, let, let's get back to doing that. So I, I did want to kind of mention those workarounds. I'm hoping most people are past the point and have got, uh, I mean, everybody should be past the point and have a working um, development environment now. So. Um, anyway, so uh, I normally clone the repository first locally, and then I normally answer yes that I want to open it up. I missed that. I, I'm too slow there. So if I want to, um, you know, I could, I could use Visual Studio Code to clone repository, uh, but now that folder has been copied um, to my assignment one. So I could also just open that folder, reopen that folder up if I closed that folder there. So, so again, I've opened this. This has been opened up um as a local project but it's not open up in a dev container so what i really want to do is open it up in a dev container so if you've got your docker and all those issues installed and set up um again it should give you the option to reopen in a dev container but if you miss that uh, you can always go um and um, um uh, there's no real easy way to do this you have to do this from the command palette so you can always do from the command palette, do, you know, search for remote containers, remote dash containers, um, and open the folder and container. You really have to have this open in the container because that's where we have all of the, um, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't want to really want to open the folder. Um, um, oh yeah, that's right, that's right. That's what I want to do. So, um, Um, so I'll select my assignment one TMC student team to open this folder up in my dev container, right? So the, the thought that I started saying there is you really have to have this in the dev container because this is where we have all the compiler, you know, all the, the development tools installed that you need for the assignments. So the compiler tools, um, um, uh, the, the build tools, the build system, the, the unit testing frameworks, uh, the code formatters and other stuff, okay? Um, so again, if I think here is where you see that first issue that I had a workaround. So if after you kind of open it up, 
but uh, instead of seeing like regular source control, you see messages about uh, this is not a Git repository. You, you probably have that first issue and you need to add the safe desktop config to get past that. So another thing I wanna mention here, when you first open up a repository, your source control differences should be clean. You shouldn't see any files uh, showing modifications. If, if all your files are showing modifications, that most likely means you've got your uh, uh, carriage return line feed settings for Git uh, incorrect. And, and um, yeah, I kind of want to get going on the assignment, but if, if you see all these, um, get with me or, and maybe I'll post again about how to fix that, um, but get with me or with the class GA, okay? But you really should not see any files modified to actually, you know, uh, edit a file and make some changes okay so what most people did wrong was selected the carriage return line feed when when uh, installing git didn't select the as is uh you know leave everything as is but selected it to modify everything to check out files using windows carriage return line feed so what happens is since everything is saved using linux carriage return line feeds it changes all the line endings to windows style and so every line shows up as being different and there, because of the invisible difference in the line feed carriage return ending, okay? Um, all right, so, but, but yeah, let's get back. So basically I've completed the first two steps um, of the checklist for getting started here. Uh, we cloned the repository, we, you know, we accepted the assignment, we've, we've cloned it. Uh, and we've opened it up um, and we've actually opened it up in the dev container. I should probably maybe expand on, on the, the second step here. You need to, to, to clone it, open up the folder and get it opened up and running in your dev container. If it's running in your dev container, you should be able to do the, uh, the build, be able to use the build system and the other tools that are in there. So in particular, uh, I'll show again, you can do it by hand. Um, so I should be able to do like a make clean uh, to clean up everything, a make all or just a simple make to rebuild all the files. And then a make unit test will actually run the unit test in a terminal here. Um, yeah, and again, in this case, there's no actual unit tests so, so, uh, for assignment one. So you should see that it runs, but there's we don't have any tests uh, initially. So um, I usually like to have my keyboard shortcuts. Um, so um, if you haven't configured your keyboard shortcuts yet, uh, in each of these repositories, there's going to be a file called keybindings.json. Uh, but uh, it doesn't it doesn't actually use these for the key bindings. So you actually have to copy these to your official or your global key bindings. So if you just take these key bindings and do you know a copy, then what you have to do is go back to the um, what is this called? I forget the the manage the, the little gear icon down here to um, uh, configure the the keyboard shortcuts. Um, and then in here. Um, um, sometimes, sometimes when I do these videos, the, my, my, uh, my video of myself kind of covers this up, but at the top right, there's an option to open the, the, the JSON file. So if you open that up and paste those in there, you'll get the, the keyboard shortcuts that I normally, you, you could, you could change something different if you want, but yeah, use control shift C to do the clean control shift B to do the make all and control shift T to run these tests on the, uh, the terminal. So with those, I should be able to, to do the same. Um, uh, th those keyboard shortcuts will only usually work when you are focus when you have when the editor has focus. So if I have if I have a, a file open in the editor and I do the Control Shift C, um, it should invoke the Make Clean uh, build task and Control Shift B to rebuild and Control Shift uh, T will run our test then again. Um, all right, so um, there's some other tools here. Um, hopefully for this class, we won't have as much problems as, as I've had in the past, but the, the class style code checker and formatter should be set up. Um, so, so if you type in code with no spaces, no formatting and do a save, it should be running the code style checker formatter um, on saves. Um, so it'll re-indent stuff. 
put spaces where the class style requires them and things like that. This is not really, uh, uh, this is more than just kind of um, um, a side thing because by enforcing a, a common style, it ensures that the differences that you commit um, are clean. Uh, so that you don't end up having differences that are just due because some people put spaces uh, before and after um, binary operators and some people don't, you know. So so you'd like only actual differences. And by using a common defined style, it makes sure it, well, it tries to make it so that only the actual things that you change, the lines of code you add or change show up in your git commits. Yeah. Uh, your IntelliSense should be working um, as part of using this, this dev containers, it should install the, um, um, hmm. oh yeah, there's, so it should install the IntelliSense extension for you in your container, running in a container. You should also have like the test mate um, and the CMake um, extensions. So. Uh, but yeah, if IntelliSense is working, another way to tell it's working, you should get um, uh, things from IntelliSense like, um, um, finding that um, um, you know that this code isn't syntactically correct with kind of these red squiggles. Um, anyway, so let's move on. Uh, and then finally, you know, you should use. Try, I'm, I'm trying to to get people to use kind of standard good practices for things. So we do have the ability to define. Um, um, sorry, to define. Um, issues so kind of normal way that we do work um, if we're working on github repositories especially if we're working with groups of people is uh, we will create issues for every task that needs to be completed um, and then maybe create pull requests for each task um, and then um, um, have all of our commits um, associated with uh, a, 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 an issue um, as we're working on it so anyway i just created the first um, uh, task one issue and I'll go ahead and um, uh, associate it with that, that with the feedback pull request here. So, so let's work on task one. So I've had you know two or three people asking, so how do we get started with this? Um, so as with the practice assignment, basically your basic workflow is that um, um, Uh, you're always going to be basically working on the task sequentially. So the first thing we do is, is um, sorry, uh, is we want to sort of undefine, we want to define task one, which will um, enable, uh, you know, by, by uh, defining that now these tests in here of the initialized memory and the other things you're supposed to do for task one um, are going to get being done here, all right? Uh, are going to be compiled. Um, now this shouldn't compile, although you know you should you should try it out. So if we do a control shift B to rebuild, um, it's going to be complaining about um, you know uh, uh, we haven't actually declared initialized memory here. Okay, so um, so normally in the assignments, you know, there's various ways that you can read the assignment description. Um, so, you know, one way is just to, to look, you know, at, at, at your repository. So the readme.md file has the description of the, the assignment and the tasks. So for our first task, uh, we're going to implement initialized memory function. Um, and there's a couple things that you need to do for this. I'm, I'm going to show you maybe 90% of this. So, so I'll get you done with 90% of task one. Um, and hopefully everybody then can complete task one here, right? So, um, so like for the practice assignment, um, initialized memory um, has not been declared um, um, in our project files, okay? So basically initialized memory, so, so notice what we're doing is in the tests is uh, we're creating an instance of our hypothetical machine simulator called sim. And then we're trying to invoke a member method of sim called initialized memory, but we haven't actually implemented this yet, or you're supposed to implement this for task one, okay? So, you know, this, this is object oriented. Um, so we've got in the, uh, let's, let's open the include file first. So we've got, We've, um, as usual for projects like this, we've um, 
um, separated the declarations of things from the actual implementation. So all the declarations of things go into the header file for our hypothetical machine simulator. Um, so um, in particular, we need to add in um, um, a declaration of the initialized memory member function, like we had to add in the function declarations, the function prototypes of the is prime and the find primes uh, um, regular functions last time. So, so by adding in the declaration inside of the definition of the hypothetical machine simulator, so these are all member functions uh, your declarations for member functions that we should be able to that we should implement and be able to call for in, on instances of a hypothetical machine simulator, right? So um, in this case, uh, the when you call initialize memory, it takes two parameters: a base and a bounds address. I'll talk about it. It's a void function. So notice we're not we're not expecting anything to be returned from this here. Okay. So. Um, um, So that tells you what the signature should look like. All right, so, so it takes two integer parameters as input um, and it's a void function, it's not re returning anything, all right? Uh, for this assignment, I gave you the, um, the um, documentation. So, so for this assignment, another way you can maybe figure out the parameters and the signatures is to read the function documentation. So for initialized memory, it takes two parameters, the base and bounds address, which are integers. And since there's no return statement, it's a void function. It's not returning anything, right? Um, so like I showed before, I mean, by adding in the declaration to the header file, that's enough for the, the this file to to know how to be compiled because because now we've said, okay, you know, anything that's a hypothetical machine simulator instance, should have uh, initialized memory um, member function implemented that takes two integers as an input and doesn't return any result, right? So now if I do my build again, um, uh, we won't get those same compile um, errors, right? So it's, uh, it's happy to compile the assignment one tests, let me say here, but when it goes to link everything together to the test executable, it complain we get a link error complaining that uh, nobody is actually implemented Initialize memory inside as a member function of the hypothetical machine simulator class, right? That has this signature. All right. So, um, uh, like we did before, I'll go ahead and do a stub function for the uh, um, this um, member function, so that we can compile and get the test running. All right. So I'll copy that. The, the one biggest difference between this, so, so make certain that you put the implementation uh, should always be associated with the function documentation here. All right, so I wanted to go after the function documentation for initialized memory. Um, later on, I might not give you the function documentation. So later on, you might be required, you're all, all functions, member functions or regular functions are required to have function documentation in this doc oxygen format. Uh, so later on, you might have to create this. So, you know, give a, a brief title, describe, the function document any input parameters into the function document exceptions document uh, the return result from the function so on. Um, anyway, so since this is a void function, we don't really have to return anything. So I just return nothing, just do a return statement. Uh, but that should be enough to allow us to build. Um, so let's try the build again. So since I modified the hypothetical machine simulator CPP file, it recompiled that object file, um, and then it tried to relink everything together, um, and um, it failed. Um, so probably should, it, it, um, um, it, it's failing. I'm probably going to have to do a clean, although my the the build system might be a little bit broken here. So it should have been able to successfully link that. Unless oh oh no, I'm wrong. So I, I skipped a step. Um, I skipped an important thing because. Um, the way I declared it, uh, it's really just a regular function. Okay, so things that are member functions in C++, you have to identify them as a member of the class by putting this the name of the class colon colon in front of the member uh, the, the 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 member function name when you implement the function. 
Okay, so yeah, you don't have to do that in the header file uh, because it knows these are all member functions of the hypothetical machine simulator because they're inside of the class declaration. But in the implementation file, uh, uh, we do have to tell the compiler, oh, by the way, these, this is actually a member function of this class that I'm trying to implement. Um, and I forgot to do that. And that's why we um, that's why we don't actually have an implementation of that member function yet. So this was just a regular function called initialized memory, not a member of our hypothetical machine simulator. All right, let's try it again. So, so yeah, it should build cleanly if, if I do that right. So, so now when I did the build, it, it successfully linked. Uh, and now I have my tests, right? Uh, and now I should be able to run my tests. Control Shift T will run them, but uh, they'll most all of them will be failing because we, we're not really doing anything yet. But that's where you want to get to, right? So every one of these tasks you want to to um, usually you're going to start by declaring the function you need to implement for the task. Maybe more than one member function you might have to declare, uh, and you put in a uh, a, a stub function, something that will just allow it to compile so you can get your test running. Uh, so then I can then start actually implementing the things um, and, 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 and and doing the actual stuff to, to pass these tests. And once I have that, also my test runner um, should be working here. So if you, if you bring up the, the test mate testing framework um, and rerun your tests, uh, you'll see that most of them are failing. Um, and by running in, in here, you will actually get the, uh, I don't know what they call this, but you'll get the, the the markup from the test runner running. So you can see exactly which tests are failing here. Right? So your general workflow, okay, good enough. Anybody, quick question on that so far? So that's all kind of prelude. You wanna to get to this point. Now we can actually start implementing what we need to implement for task one. So basically, um, initialized memory. So ultimately, I um, um, just to step back a little bit, um, ultimately, we're going to be able to take files as input and run simulations, uh, basically simulations of our hyperscale machine architecture. So for example, um, if you look in the um, directory called um, some files, uh, there's some files called like dot r dot dot res and dot sim. So the dot sim are the input files. Um, so basically, this is the same as the the textbooks example of the hypothetical machine. So the, these give the initial contents of the program counter and the accumulator, um, and then this gives the contents of memory. So we're going to simulate a memory that has a base address of 300 and a bounds address of 999, and then these are the initial values, right? So if you go back and look at our textbook, you'll you'll see that I think this was like an, a load from 940 into the accumulator, um, and then, I don't know, like an add or subtract. Um, we can see it in the result here if you want to. So, um, so, so yeah, the 1941, 1940 is a load, so we end up loading the value 3 into the accumulator um, for our first fetch execute. Uh, and then uh, the next instruction to execute is at 301, um, which is a add. So we end up adding uh, the value 3 to the value at uh, address 941 and get a 5. Uh, and then the third one, uh, when we execute the 2941 is a store. So we end up storing the 5 back out to 941 here. Um, that's what we want to end up being able to do with our simulation is, is take um, um, a spec specification as an input and simulate the hypothetical machine executing um, um, uh, the, the program that we have in memory here. Right? Um, so anyway, initialized memory is the thing that handles this part here. So when we're, when we're, getting ready to run a simulation, uh, part of the input file says, okay, we're going to have memory that has a base address of 300 and a bounds address of 999. Uh, and then after that is going to be the contents of the memory. But I need to set up things so that I can um, simulate memory with, with that range of addresses. Um, so, um, I'm going to close off a little bit of stuff here. Uh, 
so notice again this is you know i'm i'm assuming people know kind of object oriented programming um the the basics of it even if you haven't really done c++ or done it in a while so in particular this class has member functions but it also has member variables so every instance of hypothetical machine simulator has all of these member variables that it uses to you know perform the simulation um so the, the initialized memory, I mean, the very first thing we need to do is that we need to initialize the memory base and bounds address to what was indicated by calling the, the um, initialized memory here, right? Um, so all that means, since this is a member function, Uh, I can do something like that. Okay, so the um, um, the name of the parameter, as I called it here, was base address, um, but the name of the um, member variable is memory base address. Okay, so I, I just assigned the parameter in here. So uh, in fact, uh, you don't really need the this pointer. Um, so uh, if if you're inside of a member function of a class, normally in an object oriented uh, programming language. Um, this refers to the instance of the memory base address for the, 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 the member variable member base address for the instance uh, that we're using. Um, so in particular, since we create an instance of SIM, after we call SIM initialized memory, the SIM's memory base address should be 300 and the SIM's dot memory bounds address should be 999. All right. Um, So uh, what you'll see by doing that uh, now, you know, I, I encourage you to, to do incremental program development. Um, so, so in fact, at, at the slowest, just uh, try to keep it to like adding one line of code at a time. Because if you do that, you'll be able, you need to always keep your code in a compilable and runnable state so you can compile it and run the test. Okay. So you never want to be typing in, you know, five, 10 lines of code and then finding you have a compile error and not be able to figure out, okay, what did I do that broke the compile and I can't get it back to compile it anymore. Right. So, so if you add things slowly, you're more likely to keep everything in a compilable state. Right. Also, you know, uh, some people make mistakes, but try and never push a commit to GitHub that's not compiling, right? Um, and always check the commit after you push it. And, and if it seems like it's not compiling, fix that and, and push a, a fixed commit that is compiling immediately, all right? Um, so I'll show that. Um, but but what you should find if, if we initialize the memory base address, member variable, um, and if I rebuild, It should build, you know, um, um, so it is building cleanly. Now, if I rerun my tests, for example, um, you'll notice that, um, I mean, even though this test case is failing, but it, it, it's now passing the first check here because I, I initialized uh, the memory base address to be 300. And then when we called the get memory base address uh, accessor function, so we can look at the, the get memory base address accessor function, what it does. Um, um, by the way, kind of a hint for me, I really like using the outline uh, in Visual Studio Code. So instead of just scrolling through here, um, we can bring up the outline and this will show me all the functions that are currently um, implemented in, in my open file, the hypothetical machine similar to SCPP. So instead of kind of searching around, I can look over here and go to the, the, the get memory base address um, accessor function, right? But all, all, the, all the getter method like this does is just return the, the current value of the member variable, the, the memory base address. But since I've now initialized that um, in the initialized memory, it, it actually has a value instead of zero. Um, uh, these, these things are probably... Um, Um, uh, well, okay, yeah, they're not being initialized in the constructor. They might, we might need to initialize, initialize those constructor. I can't remember if I had that as a task or not. But, but anyway, so um, um, here though, we are initializing the first member variable. 
um, and uh, we are able to pass kind of the, the first test here, okay? Um, oh yeah, we do later on test that, that these things are initialized in the constructor, so, um, or in the reset. Uh, maybe it's the reset function um, that does it, but, but we'll check those, so. Um, so anyway, so we can get the second test to pass then um, if we initialize the bounds address, right? So the, the base address is the, the lowest um, um, valid address in the simulation that we'll use. And the bounds address is the upper, the highest um, um, valid memory address that we can use in the simulation. So, um, and, oh, and because um, because our hypothetical machine used a 16 bits, and uh, it used the, the 12 bits for the address, we, we kind of limit that the maximum address um, is going to be 999, right? So it doesn't make sense to have an address 1000 um, because that would be bigger than could fit into three digits. Uh, in our hypothetical machine, although we're, we're really just doing things in decimal instead of hexadecimal. Uh, we didn't add in the thing that um, uh, everything is actually hexadecimal values. So um, that, that makes the simulation a little bit more, actually quite a bit more complex. Um, so we just kind of skipped over that here. So So I'll go ahead and initialize the bounds address then um, to what was specified by this uh, member method. Um, and if we build, and um, if we run our tests, uh, we should see that uh, I'm expecting the second test, second check here to, um, um, to be able to pass now. Um, I don't like it. whenever you run those, it kind of jumps down to the bottom. I don't like that, but but uh, usually you should go and look for the first test that's failing. Um, but but yeah, so now we're passing these first two, um, and uh, the the memory size then um, is a num another member variable, right? So this is really just the difference between those two, uh, plus one. Okay, because if the base address is three hundred, uh, think of this a little bit easier case. So let's say the base address is uh zero and the bounds address is nine uh in that case you know using zero based indexing there's actually 10 valid locations so zero one two three four five six seven eight nine gives you 10 valid memory locations right um so anyway the 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 actual memory size the actual number of locations from 399.99 where uh, both 300 and 999 are inclusive means that it's the difference of those plus one there's actually 700 um um, memory addresses that I can store values into or get values out of from 300 to 999 inclusive. All right. So that, that just means that uh, uh, we have to figure out the memory size, uh, which is a function of those two. Something like that, right? I encourage you to comment your code. I'll probably be um, giving feedback, comments about that for people in GitHub. Uh, um, so infer the memory size from the given base and the bounds address. All right. Um, all right, so that, um, well, again, so let's go ahead and go back and check. So let's um, run our tests. And now notice, oh, yeah, so now notice we're passing all of the first test case. Um, um, so we're getting those in the memory size. We're, we're passing these because reset must be initializing all those variables to zero for us. So let's go look at... Um, the reset function here. So yeah, th this is where the initializations that I was kind of looking for before actually happened uh, because the, the class constructor just calls a uh, reset uh, whenever a, a new instance is constructed. Um, and in here we initialize uh, base and bounds address and memory size to zero as well as initializing everything else and clearing everything else out in here. 
Um, so, so yeah, I mean, adding that in allows you to, um, uh, we're not passing all the task one tests, but but uh, we're getting pretty close. So, so notice we're, we're passing this test case, this test case, here's another test case, but where we use a different base and bounds address, right? Um, yeah, and the only really thing that you need to add in order to get all these these tasks to pass is uh, to throw an exception correctly here. So, but uh, let me, um, I'll come back. I might even just complete task one here, um, but I want to talk about the other task. It's already 1146 here. Um, but yeah, I might leave that uh, where it is, but let, let's, let's kind of show doing the workflow. I mean, this is significant, even though we haven't completely gotten all of task one done yet. Um, but, um, but, you know, we might want to commit this, right? So here again, notice if you've got your, um, get working correctly, we should see that only the files I made modifications to are showing up as having local modifications that are uncommitted. Uh, in particular, kind of a nice use of the source control. If I click on the file, I'll actually get a diff so I can kind of check before I make my commit. Okay, what have I changed? Um, so hopefully, so, so there are, again, this is the, the um, uh, there are some extraneous differences uh, the, the code formatter uh, added a space in there but otherwise the, the only real diff is um uh, is the addition of my code for initialized memory in the main source file here uh, my tests basically i um i just define task one yeah and that's really the only difference um, and in the header file, the only difference I should have is that I added in the declaration for initialized memory so far, all right? Let's go ahead and commit that. Um, so, you know, again, you could commit these individually or, you know, if, if I want to commit everything uh, that's changed, I can commit them all at once by doing the, the plus next to the changes here. Um, and now that these are sta staged, I can actually make an actual commit, use good commit messages. So. Um, So you need a title followed by a blank line followed by one at least one sentence or more of description. So, so partially completed task one implementation of the initialized memory member function. Uh, oops, currently we are um, initializing the base and bounds addresses and the memory size. Uh, not all tests are passing, but only tests for um, uh, throwing expected exceptions uh, are failing now. Uh, you don't have to be quite that verbose, but you know, just as an example of what you might put in there. So, you know, once you have a good commit message, uh, you can actually create the commit. Again, this is still only creating the commit locally. So now, you know, if you look here, or if you look down here, like down here, especially at the bottom on your status bar, the zero one means that there's there's zero commits uh, on the GitHub that I haven't pulled down, um, but there's one local commit that hasn't been pushed yet back up to the repository. So I can actually hit this button down here or hit this here to, to push those changes. Again, assuming you've got your secure shell key set up um, and you're not hitting any of those issues that might need workarounds, like setting your safe desktop or things like that. So, um, so you should always check, like I was saying, so now that I push that commit, uh, we should go look in our feedback pull request. We should see the commit appear on the pull back. So every commit against main should show up on this feedback pull request here, right? This is how I gather all your work um, so I can grade it for these assignments, okay? Um, oh, and by the way, um, uh, no, you can, you can, you should never, um, you should never make a commit. That, so the question was that don't push until all of task one is completed. Uh, it's kind of the opposite. Don't ever push more than one task in one commit. So I shouldn't wait till I've completed task one and two to make a commit. 
every commit needs to have at least one, every, every task has to have at least one commit. But, um, you know, if you get to good milestones, uh, partially implementing a task, it's, it's good, you know, to have, have incremental development, uh, to have um, um, the milestones um, as you're working on stuff. So here, you know, so, so this is perfectly fine. Um, we're not completed quite with task one, but um, if we've made a commit, a commit of some significant progress. Um, so this keeps a history of what we've been doing. Um, and to finish off my thought here, I mean, check. So if, if um, um, let me go back on that. So the, the, this auto grader on GitHub is really running the same unit tests that you're using, right? But, you know, sometimes you might forget to add something to the commit. Um, so, so it's always good to go and check this, right? So, so basically, if you look at the run workflow for the commit I just made, I should see the same um, results happening. So if I was to compare this, um, um, so in particular, you know, if you want a quick comparison, if you look at the summary for my task, you know, so task one um, is not passing yet, it's passing four of the five test cases, um, it's passing 15 of the 22 assertions. Um, which um, I guess you'd have to do the control shift T to run the, the test on the command line, but you should get the same result there and the same uh, tests failing uh, here. Four or five test cases and 15, 22 assertions. Passing so far, right? Um, yeah, and since none of the tasks are passing, um, we're not getting any points. Uh, in this assignment, I'm giving like a base of 40 points as long as the code compiles and runs. Um, and then there'll be about like 10 points for each of these tasks. Or probably not quite 10, but five or 10 points for each of the other tasks to get completed for your um, final points on the assignment. Um, 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 okay, um, we can look at that uh, afterwards, so, uh, or you can get with the, the GA uh, and ask about it. Um, all right. Let's finish out the discussion of task one here. Uh, and then I'm mostly just going to discuss the other tasks. So, um, Actually, I'm going to go ahead and show you about the exception so that everybody can can get, although I won't do it, complete it, but um, um, uh, I can see that, that I probably should um, update, um, add a little bit more description here for the task one because it's not mentioning like the exceptions, I guess, here, although it is mentioning another thing that needs to happen in the, the task one in the initialized memory is that we dynamically allocate uh, memory of the given size. Okay. So it kind of gave you what you need to do. So if you've calculated memory size correctly, this will dynamically allocate an array um, and um, um, memory is a member variable. So you do need to have this in your initialized memory somewhere after you've correctly uh, calculated the memory size. Um, you know, again, the way that works, you, you might have to go and review um, C++ pointers and things like that, but in, in the header file, there's a member variable called memory, which is an integer pointer, but basically if we allocate a block of, of, of memory, uh, we can use this like an array, like a regular C array, after we dynamically allocate the memory uh, like we show here. So we're actually, memory will actually be an array of, for example, 700, size 700, um, if the memory size was 700 there. Um, which would mean that we could do things like, um, which would mean, you know, so after we allocate the memory, after we allocate the memory, also you should initialize the memory to have all zeros. So for example, since memory is actually pointing to a block of integers, you can treat it like a regular C array. So if I wanted to individually um, initialize each 
value one, one by one, I could do that. You know, memory at index zero, zero, memory at index one. And, and you know, again, if the memory size is 700, that means that the indexes go from zero to 699 since we're using zero-based indexing. But yeah, to initialize that correctly, you'd have to add a loop in there and initialize everything to zero after you dynamically allocate the memory. So, um, um, and one more word about the um, task one. So the the tests are currently not passing for task one. Uh, basically, the only thing that's really left, although you really should do need to implement that initial the the the, the memory member variable, but um, it, if you don't do that step right now, it won't. Um, uh, you'll still be able to get your test to pass for task one, but later on, that will get tested. Um, so if you don't do it now, you'd have to go back um, and implement it later. Um, but in particular, so one thing though is we we are doing a little bit of error checking. So we're we're expecting to throw a simulation if you give a, a base address or a bounds address that's more than three digits, so one thousand or greater. So if if so, what we're saying here is that if you ask to initialize memory with a bounds address of like a thousand or five thousand, it should be throwing. We're expecting it to throw a um, simulator exception, or, or negative addresses should throw simulator exceptions. Um, and but but also like a, a, an address that's too big for the base address also should throw an exception. We're, we're not we're not checking that the base address is less than or equal to the bounds address. Which we're only strictly checking here that the base address and, and bounds address are not bigger than nine ninety nine, or, or and that neither of them is negative. All right. So um, I, I think there's some other examples of throwing exceptions in here. So maybe I'll just. Um, Kind of search for like throw. Um, so here's an example of throwing exception um, that you could use. So to throw an exception, basically we've already defined for you a class called simulator exception. All you need to do is give the error message that you want to throw on simulator exception, right? So so again, back to initialize memory. You, you should do this before you you know, actually initialize stuff because this is an error check. So you want to throw this exception before you actually, for example, do memory size or try to allocate memory based on those if those are bad, you know. So basically, you know, if the base or if the base address is greater than equal to 1000 or the bounds address is greater than equal to 1000, throw that exception. Or if, if the base address or bounds address is less than zero, Throw that exception. All right. So you have to check for all four of those kind of possibilities. Um, and if you do that, that should allow you to pass um, all the tests for task one, including these expected exceptions here. All right. Change, I, I didn't show it, but do change the error message to something more meaningful. So. Um, All right, so you should really never move on to the other task until you get all of the tasks passing. Uh, a lot of times, uh, even the, the uh, subsequent tasks will actually depend on a correct implementation of the function in a previous task. So um, it, it's, it's hard to debug, maybe impossible sometimes, unless you've correctly gotten all previous tasks passing, right? But, you know, at this point, you know, um, if I were to add in those exceptions, I could move on to task two. Right. So, um, you know, you'd have to do the same steps. So, so once you begin task two, you'd want to define uh, the, the, the task two. Um, so we have our task two tests. So for task two, um, you're going to be adding a translate address member function. So then the next thing I would need to do is add a, a declaration for this in the header file um, and add um, um, a stub implementation and make certain that it compiles um, and runs these tests. All right. Translate address basically takes um, a virtual address and translates it to an index for the memory array. Okay. So I kind of did this on purpose uh, in the simulation 
Uh, this is an example of something that we're going to be looking at in the, uh, the, the last or the second to last unit about uh, uh, doing memory management. Okay. But so you can kind of think of the, um, of like the base and bounds address as like virtual addresses. So all the addresses in like our SIM files are going to be in terms of this virtual address space from 300 to 1,000. But um, remember when you allocate the array, it's going to be an array, like for example, of size 700, but the valid indexes for the memory array are going to be zero to um, 699 in that case. But we need to map the, 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 the virtual addresses, 300 needs to map to index zero of our actual allocated memory uh, array that we're using for the simulation, all right? So that's what translate address does. It, it's really translating from what I think of as the virtual address in our simulation to the real address or the real memory index. So for a base and bounds of 309.99, if I say, if I ask translate address 300, uh, it should translate to index zero or real memory address zero. 476 is 176 um, of an offset from the base address. So it should translate to 176, right? And since the, the, the last valid um, um, address in the simulation is 999, 999 should translate to um, 699, index 699 in the memory array, since the memory array is size 700 and the valid indexes go from six to from zero to 699. All right. Um, and then likewise, the, the translate address um, um, uh, does a little bit of error checking. So if I say that the, the virtual addresses go from 300 to 999, um, translate address should throw an exception if I give a value smaller than the base address as an address to translate or a value bigger than the bounds address as an address to translate. So that's what's being tested here. All right? Um, or, you know, um, likewise, if the if the base and bounds go from 187 to 432, I should throw an exception if I give 186 or 433. So. Um, um, task three was broken up into two steps. So if I ever do this, you should do these one by one. Um, although, you know, there's only one task three total for the assignment. But you want to first start by, you know, just doing the, the getting the task three part one test to complete. Once you do that, then you should uh, define and do the, the second part of, of the task uh, three here. Um, so for task three, we're going to implement peek and poke. So uh, we, we implement these methods. These are basically going to be used by the simulation to actually implement most of uh, the instructions in the hypothetical machine, right? So like uh, a load instruction, we're basically going to peek the address that's given in the load instruction um, and save that to the accumulator. Um, or for a store instruction, we're going to get the value out of the accumulator and poke that back out to memory. Okay, so peek is really just reading the value from memory, reading it out, um, and then poke takes an address and it takes a value um, and it should we should write that value into the simulation at the at the indicated memory address. Notice peak and poke address always take virtual addresses. Okay, so you have to reuse translate address to implement the, the peak and poke address, right? So the first thing you'll do, I believe, in both cases is translate the address that you're given. Um, so like if I'm peaking to 300, I need to translate the virtual address 300 to the index in my memory array, which is index zero. Uh, in this case, and then I need to read the value out of memory at index zero and return that for the result of peak address. Okay, so by here is, is when we're we are testing that you've initialized everything to zero. So if you don't initialize memory to zero, um, you might have garbage in your array. So you might these tests could uh, fail um, if you haven't initialized all of that memory to zero when, when you try and peek it out because we've we've reset the simulation um, and we've initialized memory. Um, so we're expecting zeros for everything. Um, and then, 
Um, the second part was um, um, once you've got peak and poke working, the, the loading of full simulation should be working. Uh, in fact, though I don't. Um, oh yeah, so the, the only thing you have to do to get this part working is we have to use poke and peak address, but until you actually add those declarations and implement those those functions, uh, the code wouldn't compile if, if we actually had calls to these. So what you'll find if you go look into the load program um, here, so, so if we go and look at the, the, the load program, um, somewhere down here, um, um, it wants to use like your poke address um, and your peak address, uh, maybe just the poke address. But yeah, find those, um, maybe just poke address is the only thing you have to uncomment there. Um, but, but, but if you uncomment that and recompile, that should be the only thing to get the second part of the task three to be working there. So sometimes uh, I do things like that because, you know, again, I, I want you to actually write the declaration and the implementation of poke address, but I want to reuse your function. So I have to comment things out so the code compiles um, and, and you have to leave those comments out until you've actually done that step to implement that function that's needed for the simulation. Um, all right. I'm just going to go ahead and um, define all these here. Use the search and replace to change all these to defines. There we go. Um, so let's see, task four then. Um, so basically then we're, we're going to be implementing the actual fetch and execute. Um, so, so the rest of the tasks are to implement like the fetch and execute functions that perform the fetch execute cycle for the hypothetical machine. Okay. So um, um, basically fetch is a void function. It takes no parameters input. I think all of these functions after this are kind of void functions that take no parameters input. They're basically just working on the, the hypothetical machine system state to do their work, okay? So the only result of doing a fetch should be that after you do a fetch, if we load, here we're loading program one, so maybe I should open that file back up again. So uh, program one is this program, which the, the program counter starts initially at 300. So after doing the first fetch, we should find that 1941 is in the instruction register. Because remember for a fetch, we're just fetching the value out of whatever the program counter is pointing to into the instruction register. All right, so that's all we're testing here. So, so we load program one. If we do one fetch, the instruction register is one nine forty, um, and uh, oh, the the program counters should be incremented in the um, uh, execute stage. So here, the, the fetch isn't isn't incrementing. So the program counter is still pointing to three hundred. So, um, so, but but yeah, if we uh, increment the program counter, the program counter should be three hundred one at that point. So then the the next fetch should fetch. The value 5940 into the instruction register, right? Oops. So, um, so your implementation of fetch, uh, you need to reuse the, um, um, the, the, the peak. This. So, whatever the program counter, whatever the value, in the value of the program counter is, you want to peak that value to memory um, and assign that to the accumulator, right? Um, where I will just point out, and I'm thinking about it, so there are other member variables I haven't mentioned, but you know, all of the uh, registers um, are a member variable in the simulation. So you've got the PC for the program counter, the accumulator, AC for the accumulator, IR for the instruction register, um, and two more here that I'll talk about when we do the execute stage. Um, Oh, 
All right. So that, that was the fetch. Fetch should be a relatively simple function. Uh, it shouldn't require more than two or three lines of code to implement fetch. Execute um, is a little bit more complex. So what needs to happen on execute is we need to execute whatever's in the instruction register. Okay. So, so fetch should have put the value in the IR. So to execute, what we're going to do is we need to first do like a, D, a simulation of a decode of the instruction. Um, so that's what these other two member variables are for. Um, so there's two other member variables called the op, IR opcode um, and IR address, right? So um, if the fetch fetches 1940 in there, the, the, the first digit, again, we're just using decimal instead of hexadecimal, but, but the first digit of this decimal 1940 represents the opcode. So after you do the execute, it should have translated um, 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 this instruction to an opcode of one, which was like the load. And then the other three digits um, are the implied address. And that goes into the IR address member variable, right? Um, so I'm sure I described this in the assignment description, but basically you can use like a, a integer division and the modulus operators do this. So like if you do a, a modulus of a thousand, so if you divide by a thousand, um, if you get the remainder, which is what the modulus does, the remainder of dividing by a thousand um, is 940. Um, um, so doing modulus gets off the last three digits. If you do an integer division, it throws away the remainder. So the integer division of one nine forty by a thousand is one. So that, that's how you translate the, you know, pull out the first digit to get the um, instruction. Right. Um, but then after that, after you translate the address, basically you need to have a big switch statement, but, but you don't really have to implement that, I think, until task six, because basically after you've translated the instruction, uh, there's separate functions uh, to execute each of the instructions that are hypothetical machine support. So those execute load, execute store, and these are all, in, all implemented in task six, right? So basically what you need to do is throw in a big switch statement that 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 does a switch on the um, the IR opcode, um, and then it calls the function. So if the IR opcode is load or one, um, you end up calling the um, execute load um, function, which is being uh, tested implicitly here, right? And then these all have to do the correct things, right? So um, um, here, program three just has loads that's being tested here. I'll just show one more of these. So program three is um, um, uh, I guess I guess it's only the first value at, at register at at memory three hundred that's a load. I thought there was more. Um, But anyway, these should be the results. So after you do the execute, um, you know, uh, for a load, we're expecting that um, if the value 42, so, so if we have a load of um, from 1940 here, um, oh, I'm sorry, I opened the wrong one. That's, that's why I'm getting confused. So uh, program three is actually this one. There we go. So these are all loads. So um, if our first instruction does a load from 150, 150 has a value 42 here. So sorry about that. But yeah, this is the actual one that's being tested uh, here in, in the, the, the test case. So yeah, after executing your load, we expect that the accumulator has a 42. Right? Instruction, the IR address has the 150 and the opcode is one. All right. And so, so I want to kind of skip over, you know, but yeah, um, you have to implement the load, the store, um, the uh, add. Uh, all of these, uh, though, should be relatively simple or three line um, things. And all of these you are mostly going to be reusing like the peak and the poke to implement it. So, for example, for load, again, you, you've got the address in the IR address um, member variable. So you want to peek out the value, whatever the IR address says, if you're trying to ex execute a load and store that in the accumulator. Right? And the store, and then a st execute store is the reverse. So in that case, you want to 
uh, whatever's in the accumulator, you want to use a poke address to poke that to whatever uh, the in instruction register address uh, is pointing to. Right? Uh, so then, yeah, you've got add, subtract, and we've got a basic jump. So for a jump, um, if you execute a jump, whatever is in the accumulator, uh, it, it's an absolute jump. So whatever is in the accumulator should just be set uh, you should set the program counter to be, um, sorry, you should set the program counter to be whatever's in the address register if you're doing an absolute jump, right? So IR address will have the location you want to jump to. Um, so after the execute, that's what the program counter will be set to. Um, And yeah, for task seven, um, you don't have a whole lot to do. So again, task seven, you just need to uncomment some things to get the task seven test to pass. So run simulation calls like your fetch and execute. Um, so I believe once you get to that part, uh, what all you really need to do is kind of look down here in the run simulation method, which runs a full simulation. Um, and um, you have to like uh, uncomment. I guess everything commented out there. So if you just remove that, um, the 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 full simulation is just a, a loop that, that keeps going until we we detect that we've gotten to the end of the program. Until we got to like a no op. So you know, basically, it calls fetch displays the, the, the status after the fetch, and then it calls execute, displays the status after the execute. Increment it, keeping track of how many cycles we've run of the simulation um, and do some other stuff and, and halting if we ever get to it like a no-op instruction. All right, so it's already 12.17 here. Um, we kind of wanted to wrap up. Uh, anybody want to kind of, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, that was, that was kind of uh, all the tasks there. Anybody want to ask a question that's uh, still on here? Yes, I have a question. Sure. Uh, can I share my screen? Um, is it like a general question or is it like specific to getting your uh, thing working? I think it's a general question. Everyone will uh, get to that point. Let's see. Um, okay, sure. Um, let's go and share it. Uh, I think I gave permission, so. Okay. Uh, do I have to, I might have to stop share first. I'll stop my share. Okay, so do uh, my share screen. Uh, Although, tell you, actually, um, maybe I'm gonna stop it. Yeah, if you're gonna be showing your code here, um, I'm probably gonna to to, to um, have you go because I want I want everybody to kind of do their own um, implementation and not be looking at um, examples of, of how other people are implementing the stuff. So. Um, so yeah, why don't, we, why don't we take that kind of offline here? So um, okay, okay, sure. So um, oh, although if you want to just kind of ask it in general, uh, maybe I can just give a, a, a verbal answer instead of looking at the code. So. Oh okay, sure. Yeah, let me just. Oh, I was out. Oh. Um, oh no. Oh, my question is, uh, when we get to the um, assignment one, there is uh, like a, uh, issues, like seven issues for seven tasks. So like, do we connect them when we work on each task? Um, yeah, you should. So um, so going back to my um, desk, my, my um, screen here, um, I, I don't think I'm going to take off anything for this, but you know, this is just try to get people to, to use kind of standard sorts of things when working with GitHub and stuff. But, but yeah, when you're working on task two, you know, you should go back to your issues when, when you're ready to start task two. I, I didn't say that, but go back to your issues, uh, go ahead and create uh -huh. the, the task two issue, um, and then you know uh, associate that with your pull request. So, so it's good to try and remember to do that. Um, so that we'll, we have task two and then we associate it with our feedback pull requests and then start working on the, the task two tests, so. Okay, so like each section separately. Yeah, sure. Right. The, these um, um, okay. issues, um, um, 
I don't know if I've mentioned it before, but uh, if you look at the issue, there might be more information here, although uh, I doubt that I gave a lot of information on these tasks here, but sometimes I'll give more, um, more um, details about like suggested approaches to solving things or more additional requirements that you might want to be aware of. So, so yeah, you might, you might want to look over those at least um, while you're doing these assignments. Although I suspect my, my, I suspect the issues for this assignment aren't all that great. I was trying to get stuff um, ready here. <laughs> a little bit of a hurry. Okay. Okay. Understood then. Oh, no questions. All right. Okay, all right. Thank you. Um, let me go ahead and end this video then and I'll go and post it as usual. Um, for the, the person that was having a problem here, um, maybe you can email me and maybe we can jump on, although I might have to do it later in, or you can maybe um, contact the, the GA about the permission denied again. So.